We're going to be reading together now from Colossians chapter 2, starting from verse 16 down to 23. Colossians 2, 16. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head, from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with the things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. Thanks, Alice, and good morning, everyone. It's great to be together with you today. And if you are sick or you're isolating, I um, just want to encourage you to hang in there. Uh, I know that the COVID numbers are rising in our state and in our community. Uh, to the whole community, I want to say thank you for looking out for one another and loving one another. I keep seeing people at lunchtime filling up five or six containers of food and at first I think you're really greedy but actually <laughs> you're loving people who are isolating and taking food to them. It's so encouraging to see. Well some years ago when we were living in Southeast Asia I took a taxi across town and one of the local greeting phrases that you use over there is, have you been to the mosque to do the ritual prayers yet? It's kind of the equivalent of, did you watch the footy last night? <laughs> anyway, so I asked my Muslim taxi driver that question and he said, yes, yes, I went at dawn this morning. In fact, I go every day five times. And then I said, well, do you mind if I ask you a bit about that? And he said, sure, go ahead. And I said, why? Why do you do the ritual prayers? What's your goal? And he said, the goal is very simple. It's to store up merit with God. And then he went on to explain with this really vivid picture. He said, when I die, when we die, there's going to be a bridge that we need to cross to get into heaven. Now that bridge, it's as wide as a human hair and it's as sharp as a sword. That bridge is impossible to cross. But, he went on, every time I go to the mosque and pray, every time I fast, every time I do a good deed, I add one human hair's width to my bridge. I asked him, do you think you'll ever add enough human hair's width to your bridge to be able to cross into heaven? And he said, I don't know. I hope so. But I can tell you what, those people in my neighbourhood who only go to the mosque once or twice a day, they've got no chance. Well, as we kept driving across town, I went on to share the good news of the gospel with this man. And even though, sadly, he wasn't at all interested in it, I marvelled afresh at just how good the good news is. As I shared the good news, as I contrasted it with the burden that this man was under, I remember thinking, I'm so thankful that my religion isn't like that. Or is it? A Christian pastor by the name of Kevin Miller wrote an article called I Don't Feel Like a Very Good Christian. In it he recounts this moment with his wife. Have a listen. I could tell something was bothering my wife one evening. She was quieter than usual and didn't look at me as much. Finally, after the kids were put to bed, she said, I don't know what's wrong. What do you mean? I asked. 
Well, she said, I just, I just don't feel like a very good Christian. I asked, what do you think is making you feel like that? I haven't had a quiet time for a while, she confessed. After chasing two small kids all day, I feel wiped out. I'm too tired to read the Bible and pray. Mornings are crazy and the kids don't nap at the same time, so I haven't had devotions in weeks. I'm not even sure I have a relationship with God anymore. Now Miller goes on to explain in the article that as he listened to his wife's words, he realised that he was caught in the same mindset. He writes, that week I had written in my journal, Lord, I want to live more simply as Jesus did, but I love money as much as anyone else. I should be out ministering in some way, maybe at the nursing home, but I haven't got going. I haven't been reading my Bible and praying like I should. I want to lead family devotions on Sunday nights, but I've been so sporadic lately. I feel like I've failed you. That day, Kevin Miller and his wife, two committed, Bible-believing, doctrine-of-grace-embracing Christians, realised that they had inadvertently slipped into the mindset of Christian legalism. Not too different from the mindset of my Muslim taxi driver that day. Legalism. It's where we evaluate our standing before God. It's where we evaluate the standing of others before God based on what we do, on our Bible reading, on our prayer, on our ministry. And so here is the paradoxical situation that we can sometimes find ourselves in. One day we can be thankful like I was in the taxi for the grace that we have in the gospel. And yet the next we can find ourselves thinking of the things that we do as things that affect our standing before God, as ways to widen our bridge, as ways to add a human hair's width to our bridge. And what's more, there's one group that is particularly at risk of this problem. Do you know who it is? It's you. Have a listen to what the Christian authors Anderson, Miller and Travis write. It's not those who are half-hearted or spiritually lazy who struggle with Christian legalism. It's those who are highly motivated to serve who take the bait. The bait of gauging their spirituality based on the outward exterior practices of the Christian faith. That's you. If you're at Bible college, if you're taking the time to listen to this podcast, that makes you one of the highly motivated to serve ones. You are at risk. We are at risk. At risk of inadvertently sliding into legalism. The Colossians were at risk of sliding into legalism. They'd come to Christ, as we've seen in previous Principles Hour, they came to Christ when Epaphras preached the good news of grace. But now as they seek to grow as Christians, they're at risk of Christian legalism. And the situation that's triggering this for them is that there's this group of teachers in their church who are advancing the message of Christian legalism. And so what we've got in this letter from Paul is a a letter to the Colossians responding to this problem, warning them, warning them of the dangers of Christian legalism. And the passage that we're looking at today really is just a continuation of the passage that we looked at last week. Today is part two of Paul's two-part critique of Christian legalism. So last week in part one, we had the positive. What is so good about the gospel? And today, in part two, we've got the negative. What is so bad about legalism? Now, we definitely need to hear the positive. That in Christ we have everything we need. 
that in Christ we already have freedom from spiritual insecurity, freedom from the rule of sin, freedom from guilt for sin. We definitely need to hear that, the positive. But we also need to hear the negative, today's passage. We also need to hear what's so bad about legalism. Because the reality is, people like you and me, highly motivated people, people who know the doctrine of grace, people who can even eloquently explain and teach the doctrine of grace to others, we can accidentally, inadvertently slip into the mindset of Christian legalism. And as we'll see from today's passage, that is not a place that we want to be. We need to be equipped to recognise legalism, to avoid it. We need to be motivated to recognise and avoid it. So we need to hear what Paul has to say in this passage. So let's dive in. What's so bad about legalism? That's our question. We're going to find three answers in this text. And the first is this. If we're caught in legalism, we're misusing the law. We're misusing the law. We're taking something good from God and we're misusing it. We're twisting it. We're abusing it. Have a look with me. Verse 16 of chapter 2 of Colossians. Paul writes, verse 16, Therefore do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. The teachers in Colossae, it seems they were making observance of Old Testament laws a marker of genuine faith. That list there in verse 16, it's a list of Old Testament laws. What you eat or drink, that's the food laws. Uh, a religious festival, the word that's used there in, in, in the Greek is a word commonly used in the Old Testament translation into the Greek for the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. A new moon celebration. If you want to find out about the new moon sacrifices, you can read about that in the book of Numbers. And then, of course, the Sabbath, that's one of the most famous Old Testament laws. So what we're talking about here in verse 16, it's Old Testament laws. But what's important to notice it's what the teachers are doing with these Old Testament laws. See, they're using them as a marker of genuine faith. They're judging people. They're judging people. They're making evaluations on, uh, as to whether their spiritual, uh, evaluations of their spiritual standing according to whether or not they're observing the rules. The problem with that, says Paul, is that's a misuse of the laws. Read with me from verse 17. These, that is, the laws he's just listed, these are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. These Old Testament laws, they were anticipating something. Just like a shadow is to its object, so the Old Testament laws are to their reality. They show the shape, they show the contour of the reality, they, they point to it, they anticipate it, and the reality that they are pointing to and anticipating is Christ. Let's think about how that might play out with these laws he's listed. You've got the food laws. They help us to understand the difference between clean and unclean. They find their reality in Christ. Christ who brings perfect cleansing. You've got the feasts that he lists there, feasts which help God's people celebrate God's provision. They find their, their fulfilment in the reality too, in Christ. Christ, God's perfect provision. The Sabbath, the Sabbath which teaches us to rest, to enjoy God's presence, it finds fulfilment in the reality, in Christ who brings us into the true rest of God's presence. Now, it's important to note that these Old Testament law, laws, they're not the problem. 
They're not the problem here. They're good. They're wonderful. They anticipate Christ. They point to Christ. They drive us to Christ. They're good, but we've got to use them right. They're only good when we use them right. Paul says in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 8, he says, The law is good if one uses it properly. The problem with the teachers in Colossae is that they weren't using the law properly. They were misusing it. They were using it as a tool of judgment, human judgment. They were condemning people for not observing these rules. They were using law observance to determine who's in and who's out. The problem is that's not how the laws are supposed to be used. That's not what they're for. If we use them that way, we're misusing them. And you and I today, we can do that with Old Testament laws. It's very easy to move from, I'm going to take a day, a week for rest, to you should do the same. In fact, all genuine Christians do. Remember in verse 16, it's not the observing of these Old Testament laws that's the problem. If we read Paul elsewhere in the New Testament, we can see that he's quite indifferent as to whether some of these Old Testament laws get observed or not. It's not the observing that's the problem, it's the judging. That's the problem. When we do that, we misuse the laws. We turn a good, life-giving thing into something that is crushing. The Swiss Christian writer Paul Tournier wrote a book called Guilt and Grace. Have a listen to what he wrote in his introduction. I cannot study this very serious problem of guilt with you without raising the very obvious and tragic fact that religion, my own as well as that of all believers, can crush instead of liberate. Religion can crush. God's law can crush. And this is how it happens when we take what is good and we misuse it. And it's not just Old Testament laws that you and I might misuse. We can take other good things like daily Bible readings, prayer habits, ministry zeal, our pursuit of holiness, uh, the strength of our marriage, We can take all of these things and we can misuse them. We can turn them into litmus tests for genuine faith. And when we do that, we get crushed. We get crushed under rules that we will never perfectly keep. We get crushed and the people around us get crushed too. So our question today is, what's so bad about legalism? First answer we've seen is, we're misusing the law. Now, the second. We're misjudging ourselves. We're misjudging ourselves. Have a look with me at verse 18. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. So back to these false teachers in Colossae, it's not just Old Testament laws that they're using to judge, to to disqualify people. They're also using other practices. There's two listed here. Uh, False humility is the first, and this is probably a reference to self-denial for God, asceticism. That's where you humble yourself physically for God. You, You treat your body harshly in the pursuit of holiness. That's false humility. The second practice he lists here is worship of angels. Now, maybe the false teachers in, in Colossae, maybe they were venerating angels. Maybe, maybe they were invoking angels. We don't really know. But whatever these practices are, the issue Paul has with them here is that the teachers were using them as a basis for disqualifying others, judging people, condemning people, people who didn't do them or didn't do them enough. They're using these practices to decide who's in, and who's out. And if we keep reading in verse 18, we can see one of the ways that they did this. Have a look. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. 
let's say that after uh, denying themselves food and drink for some time, uh, some of these teachers had visions of God. That in itself doesn't seem to be the problem. It's what they do with that. They go on and on about their visions of God to others, going into great detail about what they have seen. And all the while, the implicit message is, if you haven't done this, if you haven't denied yourself like I have, if you haven't had a vision like I have, you lack something. Now, the effect of this on the Colossians is is bad. It's, It's causing this crisis of confidence which Paul is writing to address. The effect on them is bad. But Paul goes on now to show that the effect on the teachers themselves is even worse. You see, these teachers, in their disqualifying of others, in their bragging about their experiences, what they're doing is they're playing the comparison game. They're comparing themselves to others, and they always come out on top when they do that. And that's leading them to something which is spiritually deadly. And that is pride. Paul says they're being puffed up, puffed up with pride. And brothers and sisters, if anything is likely to cause us to stop clinging to Christ for all of our spiritual needs, it's pride. It's the mindset that we've got it covered ourselves. Have a look in verse 19. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. These teachers, they've lost connection with the head. They've lost connection with Christ. They've lost connection with the one and only true source of life and growth. Did you see that phrase, from whom the whole body grows? Isn't that lovely, the way that the body is actually growing together? (laughs) We're growing together. It's not actually a competition where we compare and, oh, I'm better than you. It's a group effort. Your growth is mine. My growth is yours. And notice where the growth comes from. God causes it to grow. But these teachers... They've lost connection. They've lost connection with the one and only true source of life and growth. They might have excelled at those spiritual practices. They might have had visions of God that no one else had, but that has led to a terrible misjudging of themselves, a misjudging of their own achievements. It's led to pride, and pride has led them to let go of Christ. Christian pastor called Larry Osborne has written a book, and the book is about the danger of uh, Christians accidentally, unintentionally, becoming Christian legalists. He's called his book Accidental Pharisees. And I just want to read to you how he starts the book. Have a listen. The journey to becoming an accidental Pharisee usually starts out innocently enough. It's often triggered by an eye-opening event. Sometimes it's a mission trip, a conference, or a powerful new book. Sometimes it's a small group experience that makes everything else feel like you've been playing church. Or perhaps it's a new Bible teacher who opens your eyes to things you've never seen before. So you step out in faith. You make some big changes. You clean up areas of sin and compromise. You add new spiritual disciplines as you excitedly race off towards the front of the following Jesus line. But as you press forward, it's inevitable that you begin to notice that some people lag behind you. And it's at this point that your personal pursuit of holiness can morph into something dangerous. A deepening sense of frustration with those who don't share your passionate pursuit of holiness. This is the critical juncture. If you allow your frustration to turn into disgust and disdain for people that you've left behind, you'll end up on a dangerous detour. 
Instead of becoming more like Jesus, you'll become more like his arch enemies, the Pharisees of old, looking down on others, confident in your own righteousness. And that, of course, is a terrible place to be. Pursuing holiness is good, very good. Self-denial for God can be great. Having visions of God is, is wonderful. But what do we do with those practices? What do we do with that experience? Because if we start playing the comparison game, if we conclude that oh, I'm, I'm doing better than other Christians, if we start taking pride in the fact that we're doing more, that's when something good gets turned into something spiritually deadly. What is it that you value highly in your life of faith? What is it that you care about, that you're working hard on? See, the very thing that is your gift, your strength, your passion, it also has the potential to be your downfall, to be the thing that leads you to fall into pride. Are you passionate about evangelism? Concerned about spiritual injustice? Wonderful. Watch out for the temptation to look down on those who aren't. Are you an activist for social justice? Are you committed to caring for the planet? Great. Be careful comparing yourself to those who aren't. Do you get up at 5 a.m. every day to do your devotions? Do you fast regularly? Wonderful. Don't write off those who don't as second-class Christians. Are you self-sacrificial in your giving? Great. Don't disqualify those who aren't. Are you very knowledgeable in matters of Bible and theology and missiology? Wonderful. Don't think that you're more spiritual than those who aren't. Let's not misjudge ourselves. We all need Jesus just as much as each other. The problem with comparisons and pride is that they make us forget that. Our question today, what's so bad about legalism? First, we've seen we're misusing the law. Second, we're misjudging ourselves. And now, third and finally, we're misplacing our trust. We're misplacing our trust. Legalism, legalism isn't just observing laws. That's not legalism. Legalism is observing laws for a particular purpose. Observing laws in order to achieve a particular status before God, to achieve standing before God and others, to overcome sin, restrain sin. That's what legalism is. And in these final verses, Paul says, if that's what you hope to achieve from observing laws, what you're doing is you're misplacing your trust. Because laws can never achieve that for you. Laws are totally incapable of ever achieving that for you. Have a look with me from verse 20. Paul writes, Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. That was their message. Don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Deny yourself for God. It's the path to spiritual maturity. And Paul is saying here, no, observing those laws, that'll never achieve that for you. It'll never achieve that outcome. Keep reading with me, verse 22. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely human commands and teachings. 
These rules, says Paul, that they're, they're going to perish. They're not going to last. They're human creations. They're not going to stand on that day when it really matters. They'll be useless to you on that day when you stand before God in judgment. Observing these laws can never achieve the outcome which the teachers are promising that they will. Keep reading, verse 23. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom. With their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body. What Paul's saying here is it sounds like a good idea. It seems like a really good way to, to stop sin, to restrain sensual indulgence and sin. It sounds like wisdom. But, and he finishes with a real sting, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. These laws, they sound like a good idea, but they're useless. They can't restrain sin. If that's what you want from them, they're useless. If restraining sin is what you hope to achieve, you're misplacing your trust. Laws can never do that for you. Only Christ can. One thousand five hundred years ago, there was a Christian monk in Syria by the name of Simeon the Stylite. Simeon, see some smiles. Some of you have come across him in church history already. Simeon wanted to restrain sin. He wanted to suppress all of his physical desires, and he thought if he did that, he could restrain sin. And so he chose the path of asceticism, self-denial in order to overcome the sinful impulse. And Simeon was very good at asceticism, at denying himself food, at denying himself comforts. He was kicked out of his monastery because he was causing resentment against the, from the other monks who couldn't keep up with him. But that didn't stop him. He kept pursuing this goal through asceticism. He ended up living perched on a 20-metre high pillar for the last 30 years of his life. He endured the scorching Syrian sun, he endured the bitter winter winds for 30 years, sitting atop a pole. And you know what? You know, we Christians, we've been trying to tame sin, to restrain sin by self-denial ever since. And the tragedy is, Paul says here in verse 23, it won't work. Not even Simeon's heroic efforts can do it. Not even his extreme rules can stop sin, restrain sin, tame sin. Only Christ can do that for us. And I want to say if Simeon's heroic efforts can't stop sin, then the mediocre efforts that you and I might try to do in self-denial for God aren't going to be able to do it either. You see, if we depend on rules to restrain our sin, to free us from sinful impulses, to achieve spiritual growth, if we're de depending on rules to do that, we're misplacing our trust because only Christ can do that. What's so bad about legalism? We're misusing the law. We're misjudging ourselves. We're misplacing our trust. And you might have noticed this as we went along, but these three reasons, they all have one thing in common. And that is demoting Christ. Demoting Christ. When we misuse the law, when we use the law for our standing before God, we're demoting Christ. When we misjudge ourselves, when we puff up with pride as we make comparisons to others, we're depending on ourselves and we're demoting Christ. When we misplace our trust, trusting in our self-imposed rules to stop sin in our lives, we're demoting Christ. And what a tragedy that is, because Christ offers all we want and all that we're striving to get freely by grace, 
if only we'll take hold of it by faith. What's so bad about legalism? What's so bad about legalism is that it blinds us to grace. It drags us away from grace. It stops us from clinging to Christ. It sets us on the path of building an impossible to build bridge one human hair's width at a time. See, in Christ, we already have it all. Our head that we're connected to, the one that causes us to grow. In Christ, we already have it all. Let's keep clinging to him. Let's pray. Dear gracious Father God, we thank you. We thank you that in Christ we have it all. Forgive us for when we try to earn it. Forgive us for when we misuse the law, for when we make comparisons with others and puff up with pride, for when we think we can restrain sin through our own rule-keeping efforts. May your better way always shine brighter before us, the way of Christ, the way of grace. Please give us faith to always depend on him and him alone. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.